So who would like to know the secrets of public speaking and presentations with the investment of only 45 minutes of your time? Good, I thought you might say that. Hello, I'm Simon Hall. I teach communications at the University of Cambridge in business and in government across the UK. I run my own media and public relations agency, Creative Warehouse. I'm a writer with a few novels published and I was a BBC News correspondent for 20 years. So those are my credentials for talking to you today. Before we really get started on our odyssey through public speaking and presentations, one quick question. Which of your slides is likely to be up for the longest in your presentation? Which one? Which two? Well, you're right, of course, it's the start and the end. The start because people wait expectantly in hushed awe for your brilliant words, and at the end, while well, they cheer you to the rafters and ask questions and wave their arms and generally express enormous approval of your brilliant work. Um, so, always think when you're putting a presentation together, am I making the right impression from the very start? Are my start and end images on my slides good, bold, striking, effective? And do they reflect each other? Because good stories often end where they began, as we'll look at a little later. So now we've got the opening slide sorted, let's carry on with our odyssey through public speaking and presentations. And a question for you. Why did I begin this talk asking whether you wanted to know the secret of public speaking and presentations rather than just introducing myself in the standard way? Yes, you got it. It's because I wanted to grab your attention from the very start. Why is that important? because modern attention spans are so painfully short. Any guesses what they're thought to be? And you're thinking seconds rather than minutes here. Well, there's dispute about this in the research, but it's thought probably about 10 seconds is the average modern attention span, just 10. And actually that relates to what we see around us, doesn't it? If people have a few spare seconds, the first thing they tend to do is get out their phone and check their messages or their emails. So the lesson is you've got to grab an audience from the very start or you may not grab them at all. So let's begin our odyssey through public speaking and presentations by looking at the striking starts of how to do a presentation. To work out how to do this, I'm going to look at some famous, some striking starts from, from literature, but also from speeches and songs as well, and let's see what we learn from them. And just for a bit of fun, so it's not me waffling the whole time, and I'll explain why that's important later. Let's do it as a quiz. So tell me what famous work of literature starts with these words. It is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. What's that? Of course, you're clever. It's Jane Austen, it's Pride and Prejudice, it's famous, it's gone down in history, but why has it become such a famous opening line? Well, three points. First of all, when you read that, just a handful of words, do you immediately know what kind of a story it is you're going to be reading? Is it a crime story, a thriller? No, it's not. You know immediately, in just a few words, it's a story about love and romance. So Jane Austen sets out what her story is right from the very start. Point number two, when you read something like that, beautifully expressed with the economy of words, but also the wry observer's eye and the ability to translate that into a, into a sentence onto paper, do you know that Jane Austen is someone worth spending time with, your precious, valuable time, or is she someone you think, oh, this is not going to be very interesting listening to her, what she's got to say? Well, I respectfully say she is well worth spending time with. She's going to be interesting to listen to, to read. And point number three, and probably most critically here, when you read an opening like that, do you immediately think, oh, I'm going to chuck this book aside now, I don't want to know any more? Or does it make you want to read on? Again, I would suggest it makes you want to read on. So those three points, all in just a handful of words, set out your story straight away. Give me a sense of you. Are you worth listening to? Is there something about you, wit, intellect, pride, passion, whatever, and make me want to listen, to read on? and see how those lessons were reflected in other famous striking starts of history. What about this one? I've heard there was a secret chord that David played and it pleased the Lord. I won't sing it to you, you don't deserve that. I guess most of you have got it. By all means, pause if you want to have a think about it. Got it? Yep, that's Leonard Cohen and Hallelujah. And again, the three lessons come out from this famous song. 
it immediately sets out what the song is about. Discovery, love, loss. Gives you a sense of Cohen, a master songwriter, someone worth investing your time in. And also makes you want to listen on. And again, what about this example? I'm happy to join with you today in what will go down in history as the greatest demonstration for freedom in the history of our nation. Speech, 1960s America. Yeah, of course, you've got it. It's the uh, famous I have a dream speech, Martin Luther King's I have a dream speech. And again, sets out his story, greatest demonstration for freedom in the history of our nation. Gives you a sense of the man, the pride, the passion for his cause. Makes you want to listen to him, makes you want to find out more. Those three lessons again. And then this, back to literature. It was a bright, cold day in April and the clocks were striking 13. Recognise that? Have a think? Yeah, George Orwell, 1984, Orwell's masterpiece. Known in the trade as the delayed drop in communications because everything is perfectly normal. Bright, cold day in April and the clocks are striking 13. What's going on there then? And of course, it does the same thing. It gets you interested. It sets out the story from the very start, gives you a sense of Orwell, a master writer, and makes you want to find out more. And OK, I get it. Those are a bit sort of esoteric when you're working in research and innovation. So let's have a look at some specific examples in those fields. How much more likely is an offender to commit further crimes if they serve their sentence in a modern jail versus a Victorian institution? Now, something from the social sciences. Imagine someone doing research on that very issue. What about that for a start of a presentation? Right to the heart of the story, what they're trying to find out. Gives you a sense of them, that they know what they're talking about and they're determined to discover the answer to this question. Makes you want to find out more. Interesting question, how are they going to answer it? Our research aims to produce a drug which could be as life transforming for people with multiple sclerosis as insulin was for diabetics, so one from the biotechnology field. Again, straight to the heart of the story, trying to produce a drug which could have this wonderful impact on people with multiple sclerosis, just the same as insulin does for diabetics. Gives you a sense of the, the author, the writer, the speaker, someone with a passion to discover, a real journey, a sense of discovery, and uh, makes you want to find out more. Those three points, time and time again. And finally, this one from the uh, arts. The shocks to society such as natural disasters and plagues, like our old friend, enemy, COVID-19, give rise to the greatest literature humanity has ever seen. Well, that's a good start to a presentation in my view, straight to the heart of the story, really interesting. Gives me a sense of the person who's investigating it. I wanna find out more as well. So start. Starts are probably the most critical part of your presentation. If you don't get the audience to start with, you're gonna to struggle to get them at all. So pay particular attention to your start. And those three key points, watch your story, what about you, a sense of you? How do you feel about this? You're determined, you're proud, you're gonna find out the truth of this and make me want to find out more. Now, throughout our chat today together, um, I'm gonna to give you time to do exercises so you can actually have a break from me waffling at you. So just pause, pause the video now for a minute or two and think about a presentation you're going to do on your work. How are you going to start it? Take a couple of minutes, just pause and think about it. How are you going to start it? That short, sharp and simple, sets out what your story is, gives me a sense of you, give me your character coming through this and makes me want to find out more. Right, so you've come out with a really good striking start. So your presentation's off to a flying start. Where do we go next? Well, we've got a story to tell. So let's have a look at how we electrify our storytelling. Why are you looking at a load of electricity pylons there? You might well ask, well, this is how I think of your narrative, how it flows. Imagine those pylons hold up your narrative, which is the electricity wires running between them. Now, if you've got a really good start, like that first pylon there, holding your narrative high and exciting and interesting to talk, if not much happens afterwards, you don't have many more pylons, then your narrative just flops down, it gets all boring and no one's interested anymore. So what you've got to do is after your striking start, you've got to have a series of developments, lots of interesting things coming at us thick and fast to keep our intention, keep us engaged. Let me give you an example of that with a story which goes back to my youth, to when I was uh, about 14 years old. A story called Five Minutes That Changed My Life. That's me at the back there 
with the uh, bad attitude, trying to reenact with some of my friends the cover of the Who is My Generation. Days when I had hair, glorious days. Yeah, anyway, so five minutes that changed my life. So note the striking start and how the developments come at you thick and fast. And then the ending, because we're going to talk about endings in a minute as well. So let me tell you about five minutes that changed my life. When I was at school, I was a bad kid. I was always in trouble. I was fighting. I was being lippy to teachers. I was causing no end of problems. And I was suspended and excluded a fair few times. This was when I was about 14 years old. And one day I was walking along the corridor in my school, which was a state school, a comprehensive in Sussex on the south coast there. And out of a classroom jumped two teachers, two teachers, Nigel War and Jerry Lewis. And you'll see why I remember their names so well in a minute. And they grabbed the horrible, cocky young Hall, grabbed him and pulled him into this classroom, locked the door behind us and pulled all the curtains. Now, I thought I was going to be beaten up because this was the mid 1980s. It was a savage decade. That was perfectly possible. But actually what Nigel and Jerry did was sat me down and just for five minutes gave me a real grilling. They told me I was daft because I had a good brain. I was thoughtful. I was eloquent. People listened to me. They followed me. I could lead. I could do so many things or I could chuck all my life away. And all that depended on me and what I did. And I was so taken by what those two teachers did, that intervention they had planned because they thought I was worth investing their time and their effort into. I did turn my life around from there and I went on to university and I went on to work for the BBC and I've written books and I've traveled all over, all over the place doing so many things and now teaching here at Cambridge and running my own business. I've had an amazing life, a real joy. It's been such a privilege. And I really don't think any of that would have happened without the intervention of Nigel and Jerry. And so every time I teach now, and this is why I've decided to dedicate my last 10 years or so of work and reasonable energy and brain power to teaching, it's because I understand the power an intervention can have, even just one small one like that, how you can really change lives. So that's why I teach now. And every time I do sessions, whether it's in person, in the lecture theatre, or here, here like this, I think of Nigel and Jerry, and hope that I'm honoring their wonderful legacy. So the point of that story, apart from my little ramble about my misspent youth, see how the narrative works. There are an infinite number of ways of telling any story. But if you have a strong start, like five minutes that changed my life, hopefully got you interested, a series of developments coming at you thick and fast, how I'm walking along, how I'm a bad kid, how they jump out at me, what they do, and how it all ends and then a powerful and hopefully memorable ending, then you should have a decent story. And if you think about that as a way of telling stories with the electricity pylons holding up your narrative so it's taut and interesting, that's a good way for me for thinking about a story. And if you'd like it more formally, a standard theory of storytelling goes like this. First of all, you set the scene. So that's me at school being a bad kid, slouching along the corridor like what I do. Here's the problem. Oh my word, two teachers have grabbed me, I'm in trouble gets you interested again, what's going to happen now? Rising action, oh, I'm terrified I'm going to get beaten up, what's going to happen to me? And then climax, actually they're not out to get me, they're out to help me. And then following that, the important part, which is resolution. It's how it changes the world or changes your life. And if you want it in, um, in a graphic form, it looks like that. Set the scene, see what's going on. That could be you talking about... For example, perhaps in the prison environment, talking about the issue with prisons and how we have such a problem with reoffending, rising action, what's going to happen, how do we resolve it, climax, perhaps the climax of your research paper is suggesting this is how it should be resolved, and then resolution, hopefully, perhaps making a difference and trying to tackle that problem of reoffending. So that's a classical way of how storytelling works. And uh, I hope that helps you think about how to tell your story. There is no right or wrong way. There is no set way. There is no formula for telling a story. But those are some good guidelines, which I hope might help you in your public speaking and presentations. And speak from the heart. That always helps as well. You're doing what you're doing because you believe in it. Communicate that. You won't go far wrong. OK, time for another little break for you for an exercise to get a cup of tea. So hit pause. And then think, now you've got your striking start all sorted. How does your narrative, how do you electrify your storytelling? How does your narrative progress? 
after that. Think about that for a couple of minutes and then rejoin me and we'll move on in our odyssey of public speaking and presentations. So if the start was the most important part of your presentation, what do you think is the second most important part? What's the other part that people really tend to remember? Of course, you're ahead of me again. It is the end. Now I'm going to be literary here and don't worry, this won't happen again. I'm only doing it once just to show off. In my beginning is my end. Um, classic quote from T.S. Eliot from his masterpiece, Four Quartets. Why do I put that up there? Because endings tend to work really well if you reflect how you have begun the story, but also wrap it up in a memorable and emphatic manner. Let me give you some examples. Looking back on how we did starts, see how some famous ends reflect their starts. For example, and again, let's do it as a quiz so it's not just me waffling at you. This start from a speech, four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Recognize that speech, American Civil War speech? Yeah, you got it, Abraham Lincoln, that's the Gettysburg Address. So to start with, he sets out his story just as we discussed at the beginning. What's the story about? Well, it's about liberty, liberty, principles of the nation. Gives you a sense of him, man of immense passion, dedication to his cause, makes you want to find out more. So how does he end the Gettysburg Address? Look how it reflects the beginning and ends memorably and emphatically. We here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom and the government of the people, by the people, for the people shall not perish from the earth. How about that for an ending? Emphatic and memorable and reflects the start. And see how that's also used in other forms of literature and songs. I've heard there was a secret chord that David played and it pleased the Lord. Well, we know what that is now, but how does it end, that song? And even though it all went wrong, I'll stand before the Lord of song with nothing on my tongue but hallelujah. So again, the end reflects the start goes back to the central theme of the story and ends memorably and emphatically. And uh, again, maybe it's too esoteric, but if you're thinking about your research, let's look again at the examples we saw to start with and how those presentations might end. The answer to this question, the influence of the prison environment can greatly improve government policy, the future for thousands of offenders and our society. So see how it reflects the start, this odyssey to work out the impact of the prison environment and whether we can do better and help more people. So it ends emphatically, memorably, I hope, reflecting how the journey began. What about this one? To help bring hope to the countless sufferers of multiple sclerosis where before they had no hope, we're beginning this extraordinary research journey. So again, reflects the beginning, trying to find a new drug to give more hope to people who suffer with MS hopefully ends emphatically and memorably. And finally, we'll try to answer the question whether, perhaps why, shocks to society such as COVID-19 give rise to great literature. And so if we can expect a new golden age to come. Thank you. And notice I mentioned the thank you there as well, because I don't know if you've had the same experience as me. You've been to some of these musical recitals and it's all a bit new and we're a bit nervous about what's going on. And the, and the musicians finish and we're not, quite sure they finished and then I'm normally the one who starts clapping and then they start up again and I look right a, a right idiot um make sure the audience know you've ended because apart from that end reflects the beginning and it's memorable make it emphatic so they know to start screaming and cheering and, and throwing flowers and money at you and all those sorts of things so if you end da 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 da, da thank you look them in the eye they'll know you've stopped and they'll start cheering hopefully Anyway, so let's have another pause so you can do it at exercise. So you've got the start of your, um, your presentation. You've got the narrative, a lovely electrified narrative now, a series of developments zipping along nicely. How are you going to end it? Reflect the beginning, the core of your story, make it memorable and make it emphatic. And then we'll move on. So those are the basics of storytelling, the bookends and the bit in the middle, if you like. But now let's have a look at a few more things which some people might think are advanced, but some might say are basic. However, are often overlooked. And this is something 
always worth remembering whenever you're doing a public speech or a presentation. Who is your audience? Who is the audience? Now, that is a famous photograph on that slide. I think 1960s America, one of the universities there. And um, the lecturer has obviously been doing maths or physics or something way beyond my intellectual abilities. But the point is that that blackboard and that lecture would be perfectly fine if, as this probably is, a group of undergraduates or learning about physics or maths. But imagine that audience was from the local city council, come to see the great things the university does, and they've just sat through an hour of that. What impact do you think that's going to have? So the point is, always consider your audience. It's fine to be technical if you're talking to people who are experts in your field, but if it's a more broad audience, always make sure you take out the jargon and you take out the technical talk and you just let them understand it because it could be a brilliant presentation, but it'll be wasted unless they understand it. And jargon and technical talk are a feature of every industry. Let me give you some examples now and a watchword, a little phrase, a mnemonic, if you like, um, to keep you on the straight and narrow when you're thinking about your audience. KISS. Keep it short and simple. An acronym which is used time and again in communications, which is why you've got that great big smacker threatening you there. Keep it short and simple. And I'll give you some examples of how jargon can be used to obscure meaning rather than actually help you understand what's going on. I'm a great collector of these. For example, try and translate this for me. It's a little quiz. This comes from a local government, a council briefing. High quality learning environments are a necessary precondition for the facilitation and enhancement of the ongoing pre-adulthood educational process. Any guesses what they're trying to say there? Took me a while to interpret it. It's one of my favorite examples. If you said that, people will probably not have a foggy what you're going on in about in your presentation. But if you said this, children need good schools if they are to learn properly. How much easier was that? And how much clearer? So watch out for your jargon. Keep it short and simple. Uh, I'm not one to preach in my old industry in the BBC. We used to have plenty of jargon. This is something you could have heard at a newsroom meeting in the morning. PM Presser at 12X Downing Street, location, poll core, two-way for one. Any guesses what that means? Pause if you want, have a think about it for a second. Pure jargon. We understood in the newsroom, but you try and explain to someone outside, not a clue. It means this. Prime Minister press conference at noon at Downing Street, political correspondent report from there for the one o'clock news. Simple as that. But we have our jargon. However, if you want to explain it to someone else, take the jargon out. Always think of your audience. And this is from a business in Cambridge that I work with, a great financial tech business. This is what they do. Utilizing Brownian motion models, non-regime switching data, universes, multiple quantitative data source complex clustering and characterization algorithms, we forecast equities growth. I can't even say it. Any guesses what that business does? This is how I translated it. Ready? We use advanced maths to call the markets. It really is that simple, really is that simple. Um, so when you're giving a talk, think about your audience. Absolutely fine to be technical. You're brilliant people. You understand so much about your industry, but not everyone does. Um, so make sure they can understand what you're talking about. It's not dumbing down. It's good communication. And if somebody wants more detail, they can always see you afterwards or they can ask a question in the Q&A. But keep it short and simple. And a little tip here to help you. Um, sometimes you're dealing with very technical concepts. Analogies can help a lot. And you'll hear and see this in journalism all the time. If something is really big, imagine it's a new housing development. Um, and the journalist, rather than saying lots and lots of hectares or acres, might say it's the size of 10 football pitches. And everybody goes, oh, yeah, immediately I understand, because I know roughly the size of a football pitch. Or if it's a really big building, they might say it's 10 times the height of St. Paul's Cathedral. And roughly people understand, because they've probably seen it and they know how big the cathedral is. And the analogy we used earlier on um, in the scientific research about uh, multiple sclerosis, we were looking for an analogy in that to bring through exactly what this new drug, this research could mean. And if you say something like, this could transform the lives of people with MS in the same way insulin has for people with diabetes, everybody gets it immediately because they know how important it is. So analogies can really help you there. So again, let's have a break, pause for a second, get yourself a cup of tea or water or coffee and have a think about your presentation, whether you've got one coming up, if you have, who's the audience, and how to make sure what you say, what you tell them, is comprehensible, clear and understandable. Take the jargon out and make sure everybody can understand it. 
I want to mention next another golden rule of public speaking presentations and all communications, and it's this. But what am I trying to say here? Don't put in too much info, say what you need and stop, illustrate, don't overwhelm, don't go on and on and on. What am I trying to say? What am I trying to say? I think this is what I'm trying to say. Less is more. You'll often heard that said in communications and it's absolutely true. And it's great because you can make more impact with less work, which sounds like a winner to me. Let me give you a couple of examples of less being more. Um, that kid's picture, sort of thing you see on many parents' desks, uh, when the youngster's just got the hang of colour, whoa, lots of colour. Um, how much do you think that would fetch? Put it on eBay. Not a lot, I imagine. Uh, but the other artwork, which I've rather horribly written all over with my, my type, um, anyone recognise that? I bet some of you have got at least one or two of these at home, haven't you? Yeah? It's a Mark Rothko. A Mark Rothko. Very sought after artist. Any guess how much that sold for at uh, auction? Any guesses? Go on. 10 million, 20 million, 30 million. It's in dollars. In dollars. 100 million? The answer is $186 million. Uh, now, I'm not brilliant with art, uh, but it doesn't look to me, excuse me for saying, like it took all that much work. However, incredibly valuable. Who am I to say? Obviously, highly sought after. Less is more. You don't need to put in lots of colour and lots of detail to make a big impact. Something worth remembering for your images and your slides. And also worth remembering in the form of words. We've already mentioned this chap. I know many of you will recognise him. Got it? Yeah, that's Abraham Lincoln doing the Gettysburg Address. So the Gettysburg Address goes down in history as an extraordinary example of speech making and oratory and rhetoric. It's held up as gold standard, remembered to this day. But do you know how long the Gettysburg Address went on for? It might surprise you. Have a think about it. Many people have the impression it was a long speech. Well, the truth is we don't know how long it went on for because no one was standing there with a stopwatch timing him. However, we do know how many words were involved because there are copies of the address in several libraries. And the answer is just 272 words. 272 for one of the most famous speeches in history. It probably took him less than two minutes to deliver. And why did it go down in history? Not because of the word count, but how much the words counted. Choose the right words, strong start, strong end, good narrative flow, lots of interesting stuff, speak from the heart with passion, really hit us with it. And you don't need loads and loads and loads of words. Less is more. A really good maxim to remember in the field of public speaking presentations and communications. Less is more. And if you really want to, um, if you really want an insight into, uh, into less being more, then uh, let me show you a few slides here. Let me give you another example here of less being more. Imagine I wanted to talk about the impact of storytelling on the brain. Well, there's a slide and here's some information which might help you understand. Good storytelling engages empathy, makes a listener feel the need for a product or service, area of research, embeds in their mind, benefit to them, blah, 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 blah. So lots and lots of words there. Take me a while to read that. Don't know how much of that you take in. Also notice it doesn't really work to have underlines and italics and bold. It's better to keep it simple and consistent, particularly when you start to play with features of PowerPoint like that. So another point of the impact of storytelling on the brain, stimulation of memory, key feature of storytelling, Retention of information, increasing the likelihood of repeat business or support. Again, different colors don't really work. Different whizzy techniques don't really work. A different size type point there as well, I think. And I could go on and on. Oh, another effect and some more underlining and a lesser appreciated facet of storytelling. Encourages exploration, desire, tempts people to experiment or innovate. There's a lot of words going on here. And then some more words uh, in a color which is hard to read always watch out for that simplicity and make it easy to read and more words about uh, effective storytelling promoting understanding so that would certainly be informative but how much impact do you think it would actually make on an audience how much of that would they take away with them maybe there's another way of doing it maybe less is more maybe keep it simple maybe i show you a striking image and say the impact of storytelling on the brain well 
empathy makes you feel for the story the people involved the impact it can have memory storytelling promotes you remembering the story what you were talking about it helps you remember the story great for your public speaking presentations exploration it wants makes you want to find out more about the story what you've been talking about in your speech or your presentation makes me want to find out more that's important too and understanding it promotes understanding and again i think that's important so there are two different approaches there are lots and lots of words on a slide or a striking image some bullet points and you talking around them and remember when your audience is listening they're either listening to you or they're reading what's on the screen, but they're seldom able to do both. So your words should complement what's on the screen, run alongside them, and that means the audience are hopefully getting a nice harmony of you and your slides to enhance and help with their understanding of what you're talking about. Let me give you another example now. Um, when you're using data, be careful with data. I know when you're doing research and some of the clever work that you're doing, you need to get data in there. But how long would it take me to go through all that? And yes, of course, I've made it up. It's all mocked by me. Storytelling emotional response with smoothing and factoring and other overly technical jargon. Yeah, I've made it up. Of course I have. But how long would it take me to go through all that? And how much do you think you would remember of it? Perhaps not a lot, I might suggest. Um, look carefully at your data. How much do you actually need to put in there? And often you will find one killer fact, one fact which really sums up your story. Keep an eye out for that. It can be very, very powerful, very, very powerful for you. So imagine I wanted to talk about the impact of storytelling and data and all that sort of stuff. Maybe there's a better way of doing it. Maybe I could show a striking image like this and use a quotation. Story was crucial to our evolution, more so than opposable thumbs. Opposable thumbs let us hang on. Story told us what to hang on to. Isn't that lovely? And I use the slide there because story goes back so many years in our history when stories were told around the campfire and it was a way of passing on knowledge and wisdom and understanding. So two different approaches, a blizzard of data or just a simple key quotation, a killer fact, if you like. Which do you think is more effective? I know you have to use data sometimes, but think about how much data you use. Less is more. Keep it short and simple. So have a think about your presentation now, whatever you're preparing to do, and how you can keep it short and simple, whether perhaps you can improve your slides with less is more and still yet make a bigger impact. And just before we move on from less is more and keeping it simple, if you should doubt me about this being an effective principle, let me show you less is more lesson number one. This is an example of something you probably use many times every single day, and yet you don't even realize how powerful the simplicity is. Simplicity has built a world beating business from this absolutely dominant in its field and it's largely down to simplicity. Any ideas what it is? You may struggle to think because it's just become such a part of our lives. It's an automatic reflex, the time we need anything. Any guesses what it is? A world-beating business built on simplicity. And the answer is Google. Absolutely Google. Now, you may not remember, you may, but in the early days of search engines, do you remember how complex they were? You had to tick lots of boxes and make sure you were looking for the right things. And then along comes this bunch. And all you have to do is type in what you're looking for in the box and hit return. And okay, there's a nod to more complex stuff at the top there. You can do that if you want. But actually, fundamentally, it's that simple. Type in the box and hit return. Brilliant. And I did an event with a couple of the guys from Google last year and... They said, yep, simplicity was a huge part of our success. So less is more. Simplicity can be very, very powerful for you in your work. Oh, well, sorry if I alarmed you by suddenly appearing full in frame there. But I just wanted to briefly mention a subtle but nonetheless important point of public speaking and presentations. Now, imagine I was talking to you as an audience, but instead of standing where I am, I was sort of back here a bit, about as far away from you as I could possibly get, and rather hunched up and sort of slightly 
hiding behind my notes and talking in a very quiet, timid voice. All right, it might not be the best amateur dramatics, but the difference between that and putting your notes aside and walking up away from the lectern, getting away from behind it and getting up close to the audience and looking them in the eye and being able to talk to them like this, that's quite a difference, isn't it? And uh, body language is very important in subtly, subliminally, but nonetheless portraying authority and calm and confidence in presentations and public speaking. And if you ever doubt the importance of body language and the signals that it immediately sends, have a look at this photograph. So how would you say that meeting is going? Isn't the body language telling? So always remember body language is a powerful part of your skill, your art in presenting when you're public speaking. Bear in mind these particular points. Start with a smile. Now that's really useful. First of all, it reassures the audience. It makes them think something worthwhile or something warming and interesting is coming. It also fills you with what I like to think of as sunshine. It really gets you set up and ready to perform. Own the space. Now that's something you often see people do. They hide behind a lectern or a table because it feels safer that way, doesn't it? But actually don't. Try to learn your words and come out from behind the lectern and talk direct face to face to the audience. The lectern is a barrier, but actually if you come out and get amongst the audience, it's a much more personal, much more intimate, much more interesting experience. Eye contact, again, if you've learnt the words, you can look at the audience and you don't have to keep looking down at notes or behind you to a screen. You could use cue cards for major points, but I tend to find if you have those, they'll just support you and you won't need them. You can talk around the points knowing you have a safety net if you need one. Pace, take it gently, take it slowly. I know the nerves are urging you to babble on and get through it and get out of the way and get out of here. Don't, pace it. It's much better if it's paced at a conversational type level. And I'll show you more of that in a minute. Posture, stand up. Stand proud, stand tall, and you'll get on much better. Much better for the voice, projecting the voice, much better for the authority, the authority of your presentation. And your voice. The voice is a beautiful instrument. You can lower it so we're talking more intimately, or you could boom it out. You can take it up at the end of a sentence, or you can take it down. It's a subtle instrument, but a beautiful one, voice. So body language, a key part of performing in presentations and public speaking, but sometimes overlooked, but very useful for you. So bear those tips in mind. Now, just before we move on to the next point, uh, which is another often overlooked one, but nonetheless important, a question for you. What are the most boring presentations you have ever been to? Just think for a second. What was it that made them so dull? I'm guessing, I'm betting, it might have been because the presenter just droned on blah, 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 without ever having any interaction with the audience. It didn't feel like a conversation. It felt like a monologue. So let's have a look now at the difference between monologue and dialogue. How monologue can really bore the audience senseless, but a dialogue can make much more of an impact with your presentation. And there are always ways of having a dialogue with the audience, even if they're not talking back to you. And let me show you some of my favorites. It means you can hold the attention like, whoa, these meerkats here. Excuse the amateur dramatics. <laughs> no, I never got the hang of it, but it's just my way. Um, so holding the attention. How can you hold the attention when you're speaking for perhaps quite a while? Here are some tricks which I like to use. Silence. Let the words settle particularly if you've just made a really important point. It's not just the words, it's the gaps between the words in your presentation. A silence is a signal that you've said something important, perhaps profound, useful, memorable, critical, and it always snaps the audience back to you and it gives them a second or two to digest it. So they feel they're talking, they're in a conversation with you. Takes courage, but well worth mastering. Polls. Hands up, who wants to be a better public speaker? Me. 
You can use that to introduce a bit of levity, a bit of interaction. You don't even have to have people talking to you when you do things like that. Just a hands up or an arms up can really help in terms of getting a ripple of laughter going, making you feel better, making the audience enjoy themselves and an interaction. They feel like they're with you. It's a conversation rather than a monologue. Questions. What does research tell us is the average modern attention span? I did that with you at the start. Questions, and then leave a pause after the question so people have a time to think about it. Questions can be really useful, even if they're rhetorical questions. Who needs rhetorical questions? Sorry, sorry, but you know what I mean. It gives people time to think and to interact. It feels like they're talking to you. Options, which of these best sums up your view of? Put your hand up, put your hand up, put your arm up, put your leg up, whatever. Uh, options can be good. You can use them in your presentation and it gets the audience again interacting with you rather than just being a monologue. It's variety, it's pace, things change, things happen. It's much more effective. Show and tell. This is a favourite of mine when dealing with technology. See this little box. It may not look much to you, but in a few years that'll be driving your car and cooking your tea and vacuum cleaning your house and you know the sort of thing. So show and tell. That can be useful as well. It brings the audience's attention back to you if it's been waning. And humour. Humour. Who wants to be here who was told they had to be here? That's something I often use when I'm doing training courses in places where I sense some of the people may not actually want to be there. So you've got a whole load of options there in terms of holding the attention. Get the meerkats in the audience standing up and taking notice of you. Can be very, very useful for you indeed. Very useful. Now finally, I want to come on to my last couple of points. And if there is one golden secret of good public speaking and presentations, it is probably this. Practice and preparation. There is no substitute for practicing and preparing. I prepare and practice ad nauseam, and it always helps me because I feel as confident as I can be going into something. If I'm looking after a company and we have a big pitch for investment, if it's a big talk you're doing, practice, 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 but not just before you do the talk. Get to the venue a couple of hours early if you're not familiar with it. Make sure you can see all the angles, see where everybody's going to be sitting, see where you'll be talking to, where you'll be projecting, where you're going to stand to convey authority. Make sure that you feel comfortable in that space and then prepare afterwards as well. Review how it went, what could be better, and then improve from there. Uh, it's summed up in a, a lovely quotation from uh, Muhammad Ali, one of the greatest athletes and sports people of our lives. The fight is won or lost far away from witnesses behind the lines in the gym and out there on the road long before I dance under those lights. So he said that it wasn't just that moment of performance when he boxed. It was all the time before that, the work, the practice and preparation. And there's this very, very famous quotation which sums it up succinctly and is claimed by many, many people. So I won't say who I think actually came up with it, but it's this. You've probably heard it. The only place success comes before work is in the dictionary. And I think that's absolutely true. Practice and preparation. There is absolutely no substitute for it. So in summary, public speaking and presentations, striking starts. You've only got a few seconds to grab the audience before they're on their mobile phones. Use them well. Set out your story. Give us a sense of you, your pride, passion, energy, determination. Make us want to find out more. Storytelling. Remember my electricity pilots. Got to have them coming thick and fast to keep your narrative taut and interesting. Endings. Reflect the beginning. Make them emphatic. Make them memorable. Let us know you've finished. Finish with a thank you so we can all cheer. The audience. Don't get ahead of them. Make sure they can understand you. Okay to be more technical if the audience is a more technical one. Otherwise, just make sure they can understand you or your presentation may be wasted. People don't complain if they understand. They sure complain if they don't. Kiss. Less is more. Keep it short and simple. Take the jargon out if you need to. Less is more. You don't have to go on and 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 on. Oh, sorry, I couldn't resist it. You don't have to go on and on to make a big impact. Remember Abraham Lincoln, Gettysburg Address, two minutes of a speech, 272 words. Not the word count, how much he made the words count. And visuals as well. Remember the Rothko. Less is more. More impact for less. Body language. Don't cower away like that. Be scared of the audience. You know, my tendency to uh, 
melodrama and amdram. Stand up straight, stand up proud, dominate them, take them on a journey with you, entertain them, fascinate them. Body language, really important. Holding the attention, remember the tricks, the trick of silence. Yes, that made you look up again, didn't it? Um, questions, rhetorical questions, polls, anything you like, just to get their attention back on you all the time. Remember, a dialogue, a conversation is always better than a monologue. And practice, 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 practice beforehand. And then on the day, if it's a big presentation, get there early. Work out where you're going to stand. Imagine the audience looking at you. Where am I going to be? How am I going to dominate this group? And check the IT works. Check the technology is working as well. That has tripped up many a presenter. So that's public speaking and presentations. My email address is there. By all means, get hold of me. Send me a note if this has been helpful. And if you've got any more questions, by all means, ask them. I'm always happy to try and help if I can. One final thing to mention, and it's important. It's a personal note, if you like. When I first started doing public speaking, I was terrified and I was hopeless. And I mean really terrified and I mean really hopeless. But I persisted and I think I persisted because I knew it was worthwhile trying to master the art. And I am so glad I did. Because without having got to at least a reasonable level of competence, I don't think I would have done half the things I've done, traveling around all over the place, talking about my books, my writing, the teaching, the work I do. It's been a wonderful journey. And I don't think I would have got there without at least getting reasonably decent at public speaking and presentations. So I know it's nerve wracking and I know it's not always easy, but it is worth persisting with because from my experience, if you practice and practice, you will get there and you will be very grateful for it. So I hope that's all helpful for you. I hope you go out there. I hope you tell your stories well, because I know you've got fantastic stories to tell. So go out there, do your thing. Good luck, and thank you.